What went wrong with gaming? They've been my main hobby for most of my life. I love video games. They've been my main hobby for most of my life, and now I make videos about video games, which is great. But recently, I've been analyzing new games and critiquing new systems, and I've noticed a slow but insidious trend toward games becoming more and more monetized, but not fairly monetized. <laughs> and of course not. <laughs> because if they were fairly monetized, then people wouldn't want to buy them. People want to buy the unfair advantage player monetized. It's the feeling you get when you look at a battle pass in a game you've already paid full price for. It's the tiny slither of sadness when a game you want has different exclusive levels for different consoles and you'll know you'll never get to experience every part of that game now. It's that- They had the same thing I remember with Soul Calibur in like the GameCube era. Like the GameCube version had Link and I think that the Xbox and PlayStation 1 had different exclusive characters too. Like, this is not something that's new, but it's something that's much more common. Cosmetic you want, costing 1,005 gems, but the gems are sold in packs of 1,004. It's yeah. the knowledge that year on year, the microtransactions from FIFA Ultimate Team alone make more money than Elden Ring's entire sale run. It's the unfortunate- Whoa, let's hear that again, boys. Let's hear that one more time. You, who, who, who fucking wants to hear how gaming is nowadays? Let's go. And four. It's the knowledge that year on year the microtransactions from FIFA Ultimate Team alone make more money than Elden Ring's entire sale run. It's the Man. Fucking hell. Yeah, I Wow. It's depressing? Yeah it is. The unfortunate reality of gaming after the marketing executives took over. And it's hard to explain exactly how or when it changed, but explaining things is what I do. So let's go back to the okay. start of gaming and work out when this whole mess started. And then I'll actually pinpoint the exact thing, the specific design. Was it, is it going to be the horse in oblivion? I bet it's going to be the horse in oblivion or something like that. Choice, which makes new games we'll feel see. wrong. Welcome, I'm Josh Strife-Hayes. Let's work out what the hell went wrong with the monetization of gaming. As usual, a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube who keep the channel alive. More information on how you can support at the end. For now, let's begin. Let's go back to the 1980s and early 1990s. The video game revolution was kicking Let's begin. Let's go back- I had this game on my calculator, and I would have people pay me because we had to clear our calculators every, like, Tuesday for tests, and I had two calculators. And I would have people pay me every Wednesday to recopy Asteroids and Doom onto their TI-84 calculators. And I would get like a quarter for it every single time, man. Those were the, those were the good days. Back to the 1980s and early 1990s. The video game revolution was kicking off, but home consoles weren't yet mainstream. Grind so never stops, that's right. You put your money in and play the game, effectively making arcades the socially accepted pay-to-play model. There's no denying arcades were bloody expensive. Mm -hmm. I remember dropping way more than I should have done to complete Time Crisis, but while this was expensive, there was a very simple relationship between the game, the money, and the player. Pay money, get access to the whole game. Victory depends on your skill. Game designers knew it was a simple transaction, and they yeah. knew someone would simply play as long as they were able to, so they had to make the game hard so you would die more and so pay more. This is why the turtles This is the best example of this is the Lion King on Super Nintendo. Is that the, the people that made it went on record and they said, We're sorry, we made this game so hard so you had to rent it twice. Game I'm not kidding. Water bit. It's why House of the Dead bosses were damage sponges. It's why ghosts and goblins was everything that ghosts and goblins this was is. brutal in the early days of home consoles when people would rent games we even called difficult levels blockbuster levels designed to make the rental period longer and so you'd have to keep renewing it so i don't remember that that term but okay why don't these money hungry games make us feel the same way as modern money hungry games well it's because the trade of money for game was simple and there was nothing i think another reason why it was okay is because we were kids and we didn't spend all of our time thinking about it like, for example, now we always think about, like, all this stuff. It's, like, hyper-analyzed. And back then, we never thought about this shit at all. We were just like, oh, new game, buy game. That's it. There was no thinking whatsoever. It's, it's unironically ignorance is bliss.
insidious about the transaction itself. You knew what you were giving, and you knew what you were getting. And if you were to break down the design time of a game into a pie chart at that point, it might look something like this. Story, graphics, narrative connections between them, mechanics, marketing... I'm gonna be honest, like, except for the fucking Squaresoft games, this fucking pie part is not there in any of the other games. Like, there are so many of the games, it's like, you know, fucking, like, Duke Nukem. The president's been kidnapped. Are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? Let's find out. There it is. All right. That, that, that's it. That's, that's all there is to it. And, and maybe you hook up with a girl in, like, the third, uh, the, the third level, and, and that's it. What was the first arcade game you ever played? I played Gauntlet. That was my first ever arcade game that I played. Uh, I played it at uh, Chuck E. Cheese, and I was so young that I would shoot the food with other people that would play with my mom and I, and I could use the excuse that I was so young that I didn't know what I was doing. But I did. <laughs> Bro, I knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> testing and then how much a go at the arcade costs there was a lot going on in the development yeah. of a game at these times yeah the other ones that i remember so well um i remember the the jurassic park the rail shooter i remember playing that for like an hour at chuck e cheese i remember obviously the simpsons game and then there was also uh the teenage mutant ninja turtles game and i always liked galaga the one where you're like in the ship and you can like fly around Metal Slug, yes, yes. I remember I played that at Blazer Laser Tag. Oh, fuck, man. Yeah, I think those were the ones that I really liked. Those are the ones I went hard as fuck on. But it's all focused on making a game good, because at right. that time, good games make the most money. When a company discovered a successful game, they couldn't just augment the original with downloadable content or extra levels because that technology didn't exist yet. They'd have to make a complete sequel, and so gamers got more games. Jump forward to yeah. the mid-1990s, the home console market had taken off. You buy a console, you buy a game, and then you play that game. Now, the whole lives mechanic in games at this time was a holdover from the arcade design space and wasn't actually needed in home consoles because you didn't need the player to put more money in dying when you have three well, I, I, I think obviously there was a certain element of skill to it where like you get better at for example whenever you'd play castlevania or you play mario brothers you lose all of your lives and then you get better at repeating the old levels but yeah definitely he's right then restarting from your last save, or just dying and restarting from the save anyway with no arbitrary life limit was functionally the same thing, but design moves slowly. Away yeah. from the arcade model, you no longer paid per play, and you now paid per game, and you then played as much as you wanted. Games right. were expensive, of course, but when you bought a game, it was complete. If it games were actually quite expensive back in the day. People might not remember this, but like video games back in the 90s were like 40 and $50. $50 in 1999 was a lot of fucking money, man. With bugs, it would just have bugs forever. If it shipped with secret unlockable stuff, it would have that forever. When you owned the game, mm -hmm. you owned the ability to play as much as you want of the complete experience. And this was a very simple and fair transaction. Yes. While the arcade was, here's a game, pay us to have a go, the console was, here's a game, pay us to keep it and play it whenever. But the home gaming scene wasn't just consoles, it was also PCs. Now, back then, PC gaming wasn't as mainstream as it is today, but it did come with one major advantage. PC gaming was actually complete garbage back then. I know people might reminisce on how great 90s games were. Yes, you're right. World of War, sorry, Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness was fucking amazing. But you fucking forget... All of those games that were sitting there in the Circuit City bargain bin, and they didn't even, they should have been in the fucking garbage. They were so bad that you, you would play them, they wouldn't load. My mom would always say, like, back in the 80s, whenever she'd try to buy a new game, it was like 50-50. If you buy the new software, if it works or not, then you have to call IBM and figure out what's going on, and then it doesn't work, and then it's like, ah, well, you know, it is what it is. So that's what happens, man. Like I've had I've had that happen with uh I think I had a Duke Nukem game had that. But it's like before I, I think the turning point was whenever they started selling the games in the big boxes like this, that's whenever the games actually started being good. 
But whenever they would sell them in like these little fucking pieces of plastic, like a, a rapper giving out their mixtape at like some party or something downtown, like it, the mixtape rapper ones were fucking garbage. They were so bad. Because the PC held a load of data files on its hard drive yeah. instead of just reading them from the disc or cart like a console, developers could create additional content for a game and sell that. Like the incredible RPG Baldur's Gate releasing in 1998 and then the multi-hour long expansion Tales of the Sword Coast in 1999. This was a time in gaming where developers could develop additional content, but when they did it was usually a lot of content. PC games saw expansion after expansion, Morrowind seeing yep. the Tribunal and Blood Moon expansions, Diablo 2, then the Lord of destruction expansion and all the extra modules for Neverwinter Nights. This was additional content for a game without being a I mean Blizzard had this too, right? There was like Beyond the Dark Portal for Warcraft 2 and there was uh uh Brood War. Uh, uh, that Brood War was an expansion pack right there. For Starcraft. But again, gamers didn't hate this because the transaction was very simple to understand and it felt fair. People would sometimes complain about an expansion because they just had to spend more money. But I, I think that comparatively, yes, it was received positively. You gave them money, you got an experience got designed yes. to be the most fun it could possibly be. The biggest difference in this era is there's no trickery. You're not being manipulated. It's just a straight up understandable product. If we again take the idea. I think that people would complain about games being incomplete back then or bad, but it was less likely because you couldn't really patch things live after you shipped them. So there were less incomplete games that got shipped. And the ones that were incomplete, people don't remember them because they were garbage and nobody played them. Remember the free CD-ROM games from magazines? Yeah, you'd get them in the middle and you'd, uh, you could play the demo of a game. Yeah, I remember that. I, I got some of those for Xbox even. ...of breaking down game development time into a pie chart, you've probably got a few new bits to the pie by now. Magazine adverts and articles, some TV ads, mm -hmm. and the arcade price replaced with a box price. But it is still mostly make a good game and you will make good money. Yeah. Then in 2004, online gaming really started to kick uh -oh. off with World of Warcraft being released, but Blizzard Ooh, aren't that's... the bad guys in this story, at least not yet. Yeah. For now, we need to look to the east, to another popular online game from Korea called Maple Story. Now, in Oh my fucking god. I couldn't believe whenever people played this. Whenever I actually saw what this game looked like, I thought everybody was joking. I was like, no, you're not actually playing this though, right? I mean, like, this is all like a, a meme or something. Like, no, there's no way. But no, bro, like, people went hard on this. There's even a Maple Story 2 now. I can't believe it. And the small toy capsules Gachapon had been popular for years. You Jesus. put money into a Gachapon machine and get a random toy of varying rarity. Oh, great. These systems appeal to people who like collecting things and people who like random chance or mystery. It's basically gambling on a rather inconsequential. It's gambling for children. Yeah, it just gets them into it so they understand it, they know how it works, and they're ready for whenever they get older. Yeah, like we had the same thing. How many of you guys had those little fucking things you put a quarter in or two quarters in and you turn it and then like something comes out? You're like, oh, I really hope I get the car sticker and it comes out and it's, oh, it's a sticker of a banana again. Oh, fuck, man, mom, can I have 50 cents? Yeah, I understand this all too well. ...level, but the psychology behind it is very... Very, very powerful. So MapleStory introduced an in-game Gachapon style system. Yeah. 100 yen got you a ticket for a random in-game item. And many people consider this to be the first example of a random loot box. So this was it. This piece of shit weeb game from the 2000s ruined video gaming. It wasn't the horse armor. It was this. But more importantly, this was the first moment in mainstream video games where you could pay money and not know what you were getting. You were no longer paying for the game or Which for I, my, my statement on this and my stance on this has always been very clear. Everything that you buy in a video game, you should know exactly what you're buying. You should not buy a chance at something. You should not buy a roll at something. You should not buy something that buys a chance at something. You should spend money and get immediately exactly what you spent the money for. Established product, you were paying for the mystery. The ephemeral moment of what if between yeah, purchases. Yeah, I'm mad about the honing from yesterday. Yes, I am. It's, it's fucking bullshit.
product and eventual prize. And this system made a lot of money. Because Three Maple Story billion. was online, and other people could see what you won. So it was no longer about having the game and enjoying the game, it was now about a sense of community and prestige when you have something somebody else doesn't. If you make Oh, that's the one thing that people love. People love to be the special boy. You know, oh yeah, I'm the special boy. I have the cool item. Absolutely. Game multiplayer, competition amongst players becomes a thing. And there are a subset of players who enjoy being seen as the person with the best stuff. And unlike real gachapon machines, which were either a physical distance to travel to, or had a queue by them, or sometimes just sold out, virtual gachapon tickets were unlimited, entirely within the company's control, and could be bought constantly. MapleStory already had the in-game yep. items made, so they were selling the excitement of chance, and they were tapping into the collector and completionist mentality of many hardcore gamers. So olds. game developers began to see they didn't They're actually need olds. to sell a gaming experience anymore. They could instead sell the small adrenaline spike of potential. This was a turning point. A moment in So Maple Story ruined gaming. I think that's pretty fair. Yeah. Investors realized it was completely worthwhile to dedicate at least some game development time not to the game itself but to systems within the game designed simply to extract money from the player after they had started playing, but without giving them a complete new game. This is the first part of the puzzle for where we are today. So let's put this idea of sell random chance into a little box. A box of all the design tricks which don't favour the player or make the game necessarily any better. A box of design tricks which don't make you think, oh my god, this is amazing, I need to tell all my friends. Sounds like a great box. But instead, use the game as a simple vehicle for additional monetization. Now, the techniques in this box are not games themselves. They cannot exist on their own. They aren't symbiotic with a game because they don't enhance each other. They are parasitic because they need the game to survive but don't necessarily improve it. We'll call this box abusive monetization strategies. <laughs> Yeah, it's about right. No, I, I think it's very true. Is that a lot of these systems are designed in a way that they do make the game worse. Or not utilizing these systems makes the game worse. That's like one of the worst things that pay for convenience in games has. Is that it makes it to where it is financially lucrative for a developer to make a game inconvenient. Because now they can sell the shortcut. Or for a more catchy title, Pandora's Box of Bad Design. The yeah, main danger like of this better. box is, if we were to take the pie chart of game development time now, knowing that this box exists and knowing the techniques inside it can make a decent amount of money, the finance people know they need to find space for the techniques within this box somewhere on the pie chart which means something else must lose out. Jump forward two years to 2006, the Western gaming market Just like I said. Yep. Here we go. It hasn't yet discovered the mass appeal and psychological dominance that loot boxes have, but yeah. they have discovered something just as important. Gamers will pay money to look different. And it all kicks off with this stupid horse. Now, I Oh, God. There it is. Uh, you know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. I've made a complete video on the history of this yeah. horse, but the short story is The Elder Scrolls Oblivion was a great game with some great DLC, Knights of the Nine and the Shivering Islands. I never had but any of the DLC. But you could also pay a few dollars to give your horse armor. Now, it's important yeah. to understand this is completely cosmetic. It doesn't actually make your horse any better in combat or defend it, but you can buy it. And people did. In fact, a lot of people bought it. And this highlighted another thing. Making a game takes a Well, everybody was very upset about this. And people would say, like, oh, if, you're, if you buy this, you're a loser or you're stupid or something like that, right? But yeah, I, no, I never bought this shit. Like, I, at this point, I have the strategy guide for Oblivion, but I don't have the fucking horse armor. I don't know how to download that. My mom was like, bro, she wouldn't even buy, like, she wouldn't put her credit card on the internet until, like, 2015. Like, we, I would have to go to fucking Target and buy those fucking prepaid WoW game cards for her because she would not want to have her card. Give that. You, you want me to give that to Blizzard? What the hell are they going to do with that? What are they going to do with that? What are they going to do with my card? Yeah, dude, she was, she was not about that. Time, but once the main game is made, 
the development time it would take to make a cosmetic for that game is relatively short. And that cosmetic can be sold for a small amount of money, oh, yeah. but it can be sold many, many times. The cost is more. Well, it, it, it's very simple, right? So, like, if you make something and you sell it for a dollar, and you make Elden Ring and you sell it for sixty dollars. Do you think that the thing that you made that you're selling for one dollar is only one sixtieth easier than making Elden Ring? No, it's probably one ten thousandth easier than making Elden Ring. So in terms of optimization and min-maxing, you're going to min-max selling the thing that you make for a dollar a billion times than selling the thing that you sell for sixty dollars a hundred times or a thousand times. But the sales volume is high, hence microtransaction. Separate yes. from the idea of a complete expansion. I hate how people call them microtransactions, but there's packages to buy it for $100. How the fuck is that a microtransaction? It's more than the game. That's a, that's a fucking, that, that's a macro transaction. I wish people would start saying that. Macro transactions. Every time that it's more than like $3 which would expand the game and make the game experience bigger, a microtransaction adds hardly anything beyond the original experience. Holy it's almost shit. inconsequential, but it's not free. Jesus. So now developers know, expansions are a bit risky, but microtransactions are very safe and very small. Even yeah. if they don't sell, it's not a great waste of developer time. So the focus shifted away from selling a main game with lots of expansions to selling the main game and then lots and lots and lots and lots of small additional things. The problem with this is now developers had a vested interest in keeping the coolest cosmetics or the most fun little things out of the base game and it that is something that I have complained about for, uh, I don't know, fucking 10 years. Like, I poured salt on my head about this in 2012, and everybody said I was a loser. But now, 10 years later, they realized that I was right all along. Yeah, it, 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 I fucking knew this shit was going to happen. Because if you tell people that you can make money doing this, they're going to start doing it. Of course game and instead releasing them as additional microtransactions, which is something we'll see happen more and more. And this absolutely does not favor the player, no, it because not. it leads to an experience where you as a player, even though you have bought the game, when you sit down to play it, you do not feel like you have access to the whole game, because you don't. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, yeah, you, you don't have access to it, that's the reason why. It used to be you bought a game and got a game. Now it's you buy a game and you get the main framework, which you need to pay more to flesh out. So let's add sell small additions to your game as microtransactions to the box of abusive monetization strategies. Okay. And as the box grows, so does the space it would need to take up on the game development it's path. Getting bigger. Now we head into 2009 to the rise of Facebook and one of the cornerstones. Oh, dude, like these Facebook games. Like, I remember there would be times where like people would say that their grandma got addicted to like Farmville or something on Facebook and she was spending more time on Farmville and the cat's dead. And it's been dead for like two weeks and, and like she doesn't even know about it because she's just been playing Farmville the whole time. Holy fuck. Yeah, people got addicted to this. ...of casual gaming and oh monetization. Oh my god, yeah, the Mafia game too. Farmville. Farmville was everywhere yep. in the late 2000s, made by Zynga, and these I never guys played were this. masters. Because Facebook was everywhere, everyone was on it, and even non-gamers were gaming. Which sounds great, but they were burning through the game too quickly. They were enjoying it and then just moving on, which was not great, you can't because have Facebook is all about retention. So Farmville did something really counterintuitive to increase player retention. They gave you daily energy, so you couldn't progress more than a certain amount every day. Now these games were most- And this is how every game is now. You have like these weird fucking throttling systems that make it to where you can't do any progress. Now they have this. The thing is, some of them are okay. I actually think that some of these throttling systems are fine, but most of them are not. Like, for example, only being able to do a raid and get loot from it once a week and wow is fundamentally the same thing. It's just done in a way that's not harmful to the player conduit energy yeah exactly dailies uh fucking lost ark resonance uh, i forgot even what it was called in diablo immortal but it was probably there was three different versions of that in diablo immortal probably yeah a vitality in uh tower of fantasy 
oh. be played by people on phones and laptops, and people got bored pretty quickly. And one of the best ways to prevent boredom is to limit your time with something. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, as they say. So mm -hmm. energy systems limiting what actions you could take, or timers connected to growing your crops or building things, and you couldn't progress them quicker. Well, but it's not just the energy systems. It's that the energy systems enabled them to also monetize bypassing the energy systems. That's what the, that's I think the real reason why these got implemented. It's not because people would stop playing the game. It's basically them putting ankle weights on you and then telling you that for five dollars they'll take them off for the week. They're making the player progress only in short but intense bursts and then wait for their next fix of game. Yeah. You either force them to pay more money to gain more energy or to... It's like you're wearing like a chastity belt for 23 hours and they take it off for one fucking hour and then after that you've got it back on for the rest of the day. Unless you pay five dollars. Skip the timers or you make them return tomorrow. And this is game design focused on the formation of daily habits. The psychological power of the habit has been studied for years. Motivational speakers talk about them, self-help books push them, and now gaming companies were looking to use them as a way to turn players into users. Of because course. it wasn't just about the game being fun anymore. The focus wasn't on giving the player the best experience you could well, give. Well, I think it's very important whenever you look at the terminology, right? I mean, this is it, it's a terminology change. Terminology change. Like, players are no longer players, they are now users. I think that's huge. ...them and letting the player enjoy it at their own pace. The focus was about the game being effective at encouraging a specific behavior response from the user. Yeah. Encouraging the user to return day after day is habit forming. Someone who plays your game habitually is more likely to remain playing even after the game itself has stopped being enjoyable, they're just continuing the habit. Along with this, game designers knew you would also have friends on Facebook that may not be playing the game. Oh my god, the updates from Farmville. Holy fuck, that was so annoying. Share your progress. Share your progress. Oh, somebody gave you a gift. Log on to Farmville to claim it. Oh, no. And they wanted those friends to play the game, which is why they put the mechanics in the game. I remember on. one time there was like a, a hot girl on Facebook and I saw I had a notification from her and I was like, yes. And then it was Farmville. Share this achievement with your friend to get bonuses and get boosts. A huge amount of people began playing Facebook games not because they thought they would be the type of game they enjoy, but because they were doing their friend a favor by starting up. They were supporting their farm. <laughs> Attention servitude online, I love it. They were joining their mafia. And just like Maple Story's Gacho being viewed by the players <laughs> oh, in the game, you could share the progress of your farm. You could show off how far along you were with <laughs> Recruit your fucking recruit your nephew and your grandma to come work on your farm and fucking work for free on your video game farm on Facebook. It's just like whenever you break it down, it's so stupid. But it worked and people did it spurred competition so we can add limiting progression per day and encouraging you to invite your friends to start the game to give yourself advantages or the ability to share your progression with the community which is why achievements on almost all consoles and pcs are publicly viewable into the box of abusive monetization strategies and while habitually playing something isn't generating money in itself it does keep the audience around longer so they can be exposed to other more successful strategies now, now some people well, it's more like, let's say every single time that somebody opens the game, there's a 10% chance that they're going to buy something. Well, then all you need to do is get them to open the game 10 times. So there you go. That, that Now this is the goal. You got to get them to open the game 10 times. It's that easy will point out that paying to advance more or paying to skip timers is in some ways similar to the old arcade process of dying and then putting more coins in to continue. continue yeah. And it is similar, but there is a crucial difference. With an arcade game, you could, in theory, 
finish the game entirely on skill. Yeah. These timers and energy bars in games such as Farmville cannot ever be finished on skill alone, because you will hit a wall. Yeah, you, you, there, there were no, as far as I know, there were no Farmville esports competitions. That you will need to either wait for or pay to remove. But this wasn't everything. Nowhere near. Farmville had other strategies. Yeah, TSM doesn't have a Farmville team. Pay to make them progress faster, but not with money directly. Now you had to convert real money into a proprietary currency. In this case, farm bucks. And this is one of the most prevalent designs we still see used because it does several psychological things disgustingly well. If you can buy That would actually have been so fucking funny though whenever I'm thinking about it. Like imagine if one of the big esports orgs just brought in like a bunch of the players moms and they had like a competitive farmville team and it was actually just like seven of the you know like their counter-strike players like their moms just talking about the game that would have been fucking hilarious i would watch that yeah the game you can see the cost in a currency that you understand but if the game displays items in their own proprietary currency such as gems or coins or platinum or farm bucks or whatever they want to call it you have to make one mental step converting the currency from what you understand to what you don't understand yep. so all these things are now one mental step away from having real value and that is hugely important because even once and that's why all these games have like two or three different currencies where you you buy the you you use your real money and then you buy the in-game premium currency and then you use the premium currency to buy the shop currency it's like lost ark you buy royal crystals and turn them into blue crystals and then you spend blue crystals on items in the shop step is further than most people are willing to go so, so it's like how much money are you really spending with uh you know like four hundred dollars or you know a hundred dollars of, of lost ark money it's kind of hard to say because you've got to go through royal crystals blue crystals and gold so let's add that into the box proprietary in-game premium currency to obscure real world value by a single step but i also think that every single game this should be this, this shouldn't let you do this I think that if, if you're going to have microtransactions in a game, I think that it is there is no consumer advantage that pricing in the store exists in crystals or... Oh, fuck. Is it messed up? Are we good? Testing one, two, three. Is we big good? Oh, we yeah, there it is. So, like, I, I do think that it should be just against the rules. Because, like, at a certain point, I think that what is really the government and regulatory agency's job? It is to protect individuals and consumers from predatory and unfair practices that companies have. And I feel like there is literally no advantage that having these different intermediary currencies provides to the player. This does not help anybody. This doesn't make it easier to understand. It just makes it worse. What's the line though? What do you mean where's the line? The line's simple. If you have something in the store, it's supposed to be in USD or whatever the currency of the, uh, uh, we're gonna move this a little bit. Let me move this so now you guys can see how big the box is getting. There we go. Yeah, it, you just, you just have everything in USD or, you know, euros or whatever of, of whatever that currency is. Yeah, it should be in it should be in local currency only. And that's it. Bonus points if it makes you convert the currency to multiple other in-game currencies, which is. It, it's, and, and you have to think about why is it like this? Fundamentally, the reason why it's like this is because it is designed in a way to deceive you. So how is it good for the consumer that these things exist? Well, I'll tell you, it's not. It's completely impossible to track in your own mind. So you need to buy the currency. And this is the next trick. The currency is usually yes. sold in packs, and these packs are specifically sized to either be just under what you actually need or very, very close to the next best thing, making you consider the next pack up. For they're not actually, well, they're not even either, which makes it even more uh, more difficult to like, Let's say you get a hundred a hundred keys for a hundred dollars. Well, each key is a dollar, but they don't do that. They have all these like weird, like you know, odd numbers. 
For example, if you need 100 gems to buy something in the game and gem packs are sold in packs of 90 or 205, you may as well buy the 205 pack. But then Yeah, it's like at this point, right? I mean, at this point you're you're losing money if you don't buy 505 gems. Yeah, you're just losing money. You're stupid. And there's a really good item in the game for 210. And yeah. you're only 5 gems short. But the next pack contains 500 gems. But there's a mega item for 505 gems. And you're only 5 gems shy of that now. You're exactly. not thinking about the number 505. You're thinking it's only 5 and then only another 5. Much smaller jumps for much higher jumps in value. You'd be a fool if you didn't take them, right? Exactly. So that's going in the box. You'd be losing money if you didn't spend $100 on the Primo pack that gives you 20% extra crystals. I mean, you're basically stupid if you don't spend $100. ...of bad design. But let's say you do buy a pack. Whatever pack you buy, you Ugh. will spend your unique in-game proprietary currency, but then you'll discover something else. The currency is non-refundable, and it is almost impossible to spend all of it. You'll always be left with some random number, like four yeah. gems or two bits of platinum. It's never zero. And this will bother you, because in your mind, that's a waste, and you don't like waste. And if you don't spend that currency, then the game is keeping it, and you've paid yep. for that. But the only way to make this useful is to buy another currency pack. I mean, this is just like, it, and like the logic with this is so stupid, but it works. It's like, I remember one time I had a bag of gummy lifesavers that I ate, and it started making me sick. And I thought to myself, well, I've got to eat the rest of these as fast as I can so they won't be around anymore to make me sick. Exact same mentality. Be a fool if you didn't do that, right? I ate you the can't whole bag. Premium currency just sitting there in strange, unspendable amounts. It's annoying. And it's by design. So add that to the box. Mm -hmm. But maybe you know all this, and you're not a fool. You won't spend a lot, you'll wait for a sale, but oh look, you're a brand new player and there's an <laughs> offer. A load of premium currency, a boost, a few cosmetics, it's a limited time That's offer. That's it. And it's all for the low price of just under a dollar. Now you'd definitely wow. be a fool if you didn't buy this. Yeah, you'd be an idiot. If you why the intro packs to almost any game are such good value, it's because studies have shown people who buy a single purchase are much, much more likely to make another purchase. No, it's, it's how to get, it's a, uh... Uh, the, the salesman's technique is called get, getting your foot in the door, right? It's like as soon as you can condition a person into buying something or getting getting them into a habit of doing it, then it's so much easier. Now it's yeah, now it's only a matter of uh, of, of time. So you want to make the first purchase really enticing, and it's because some phones need you to authorize in-app purchases. But once you've authorized one... Exactly. It will... and, and like also, yeah, you have your payment information saved. So now there's not that barrier to entry. Now you don't have to put in your credit card information to spend $100. All you have to do is spend $100. You just click the button. It's not, I mean, you didn't even really spend the money. I mean, where'd it go? Like you just click the button, it's done. So yeah, as soon as they have your payment info, it makes it way easier. Don't think, just buy it. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you have to just buy it because it's a limited offer and it's going to go away in two hours. And if you don't get it now, it'll be gone forever. Not double check for any extra purchases. So you confirm that you want to buy the cheap pack and then it doesn't double check for the expensive packs because every yeah. screen between the player and a purchase is a moment they could doubt and reconsider. And this is always true. And like, for example, this is the case with any sort of like online, uh, online commerce is that the different websites that you have can track whenever people leave the store. So like they can track, okay, this person put the item in their cart. Okay, this person put the item in their cart and they went to the checkout. And it's like what the drop off is at each different time period. So you want to get those, are you sure you want to purchase this checks agreed with and out the way uh, yep. unusually cheap intro microtransactions just to get you into a habit. Let's add that to the box. And while the box is looking pretty anti-player and anti-consumer so far, it's nowhere near full. To truly no, it's see not. how effective this ugly design can be, we only need to go forward one year to 20... Oh my god, bro, like this fantasy team shit. I can't fucking believe that people buy this. Like, a lot of the times, like, you're buying the same characters. And, like, the worst part about this is, like, however stupid I think FIFA is, I spent, like, $40 on Lost Art card packs yesterday. So, I I mean, it's the same exact thing. It's, it's, oh, fuck.
idiot. Yeah, well, at least every year, if I get the light of salvation plus 30, I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I won't have to worry about it for a long time. D10, and look at FIFA's ultimate team mode. Yep, now, I'm not is. really into football games, but the FIFA like franchise of games either. actually highlights the game design shift really well. It shows how games have moved from being a fun experience by themselves to a fun enough framework that other monetization tactics will cling to like limpets. In FIFA, you can buy loot boxes, which contain random cards of players, and use these to build up your ultimate team. The ultimate team mode takes several of the box ideas and combines them, and now the ultimate team mode makes more money than the box... <laughs> Holy fuck, man. Oh, we are really in for some really interesting days, aren't we? Oh my god, this is so ridiculous. Like, we are triple fucked. Like, yeah, gotcha indeed. I, I think that, again, all of this stuff is enabled by gambling. Like, if, for example, on the FIFA store, they had fucking Messi on the store, and he was $500, okay? Nobody would buy it. But the reason why they're buying it is they're getting eaten one bite at a time. They're not getting swallowed whole with the $500 purchase right on right immediately, but it's one bite at a time. It's the gamba that enables these purchases because I think that the amount of people who would actually sit there and spend $500 just to have that card and you knew that the only way that somebody had that card is that they spent $500, people would laugh at it. And if you think that I'm wrong, people laugh at you for spending $8 on Twitter. Think about how stupid you've got to be to spend $500 on a FIFA game that gets outdated next year. sales of FIFA itself. In fact, since 2018, FIFA Ultimate Team has generated over $1 billion in revenue per year for EA. In 2021, they made $1.6 billion. And it happens every single year. And the cards you buy yeah. in the Ultimate Team for one year cannot be used in the next year. Mean Why not? Why not? Why can't you use the cards in the next year? I wonder why. The microtransactions now have a shelf life. Horse armor may last forever. That's but right. What if it didn't? What if you could make a. My light of salvation will. Light, what, my, whenever I get my light of salvation up to level 30, it's going to be forever too. A player pay for it again and again every year. Let's add that to the box. Yearly repeating yep. microtransactions. Now, as a developer, you'd look at this thing, this box, and think, wow, selling my game isn't the profitable thing anymore. No. It's what I can sell within the game. Right. By now, the box of abusive monetization strategies it's getting is bigger. so big, it's almost impossible to ignore if you are making a game. What and this was, like, we haven't even gotten to 10 years ago, okay? One year later, in 2011, the MMORPG RuneScape is suffering. They had a major update to the combat system, which a huge majority of the player base hated, and this made them lose a lot of players. This is a mistake worthy of its own video, but the bottom line is, they are a monthly subscription <laughs> game, losing subscribing players. Yes. And they need to find a way to either recover paying members, or to stem the tide of people leaving. Mm, so, a subscription game that you pay monthly for, losing players, and then it having microtransactions in it. Yeah, I could see this happening. Yeah, I, I, th I think this seems reasonable, yeah. Enter the loyalty program. Every month of membership, you now earn loyalty points, and you earn more for every consecutive month that you remain subscribed. And then you can spend loyalty points on cool exclusive cosmetics, or mechanically powerful auras and boosts. So now, cancelling your membership wasn't just a case of thinking, I'm not enjoying the game, so I won't pay, which is a very simple, understandable, fair transaction. It's now a case of thinking, I'm not enjoying the game, but if I unsubscribe, you I lose break everything. my loyalty streak yeah. and will earn far fewer loyalty points. And this is what people that do to streamers, too. Like, I don't understand this. Like, I'm subscribed to some people on Twitch. Yeah, sure, they're, like, friends of mine. But it's like, some people, like, make a big deal out of, like, being subscribed to, like, different streamers and shit like that, like... Oh, I don't know, man. Like, it's just... I don't know. It, not really? Yes. Absolutely. What do you mean, really? Yeah. 
But my streak, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's not that big of a deal. At least to me, it's not. Over the long run, which will put me at a disadvantage if I ever do want to come back in the future, which is not as fair. The transaction yeah. used to be simple, but now we're putting the player in the position of give money even if you don't want to play because you don't want to break a habit. That's good. And I think this is still okay. Like, if a company wants to do this, a game developer wants to do this, I think that they should be able to do this. I don't like it, but I think it's okay if a, if a company does this. Even though it is, somebody says it's ass, it is absolutely ass. However, there are things that are much worse. Going in the box, and by now the box is demanding a bigger and bigger slice of the game design pie chart. Two Ooh. years later, 2013 sees the release of Dead Space 3, the third Never installment in a one. terrific horror trilogy. Well, sort of. While Dead Space 1 and 2 were indeed terrific horror games with tension and pacing and balanced gameplay and great stories, Dead Space 3 did something strange. It took the idea of you being a lone engineer trapped on an infested spaceship struggling against incredible odds using only your small collection of mining tools and very limited ammunition to survive, and it added in the ability to let you buy in-game guns with real cash from the cash shop. A horror survival game. What? Damn, bro, that's, I mean, wow. Okay. What's wrong with microtransactions if they're completely cosmetic? Number one, they're not cosmetic. Number two, uh, I don't have a problem with microtransactions as long as they are priced in USD and they are not a gotcha system. It, it's not a random event system. You spend money, you get thing. Literally that simple. Game selling you in-game guns and ammo, completely wow. defeating the atmosphere and vibe the game was going for. Selling players things they could use within your game to make the game easier. Let's add that to the box. That's effectively uh -oh. selling power. This one manages to out-monetize even the arcade. It would be like yeah. putting more coins into Time Crisis and getting a rocket launcher, or removing the time limit in Crazy Taxi. It's sort of... Let me think about that. Has there ever been a game back then that would sell power? The closest thing that you could possibly have would be maybe buying one of those different controllers that have a turbo button. That is the closest thing that I can think of to like back in the day pay to win. Game Shark? Yeah, that yeah, Game Shark is a good yeah, that's a good point. I actually had a Game Shark back in the day. Defeats the purpose of the original game. Along with Dead Space selling guns, we now see the MOBA game Dota 2 release what many consider the first major battle pass system. Now when this really? craze started, I, I remember 2. walking into gaming shops and seeing the phrase battle pass everywhere and I had no idea what they were. Effectively, they are optional purchases which unlock a series of challenges or processes you can go through to unlock more stuff in the game but they are time sensitive. So you buy the monthly battle pass and if you play a certain number of hours or kill a certain number of enemies or achieve a certain number of whatever it wants you to do, you can advance along the battle pass and unlock new stuff. Now I think battle passes would have been way better and I think they, they would be way better if at the end of the battle pass duration, everybody just got everything out of the battle pass. And like you could just work to unlock it inside of the season, but if you don't finish it inside the season, you can just get the rest of it at the end. Uh, I, I think that would be a lot, a lot better. Now you could just have the unlock stuff happen. be available for everyone to unlock anyway, but by limiting it to a timed battle pass, you're doing a few manipulative things. You're creating a fear of missing out or FOMO. As yes. players know, if they don't have this month's battle pass, they may never get the full experience or that rare cosmetic ever again. Oh. So you are encouraging an unhealthy amount of gameplay, because if you're not advancing your battle pass, you're losing precious time. So This is the same with, like, login rewards. I remember whenever Lost Ark had, like, some login reward that was really cool, people were logging in every single day. I remember, like, Stoops and Zeals were on vacation, and they had to go to, like, a fucking, one of those, like, computer land cafes to log into Lost Ark to to make sure that they collected their item for the day.
It was nuts. Now you're actually discouraging players from enjoying any other game and forcing them to focus entirely on progression within yours. Yeah. This design is of course at odds with the limit playtime technique because they appeal to different demographics. Remember a battle pass or limit- I think battle passes are a lot better for people that are like mono gamers. Like for example, you only play like maybe one or two games. I think battle passes are pretty much okay for those people because they're going to play through it and get it anyway. But whenever you're playing like 12 different games at a time and then you have 10 different battle passes, I think that's whenever things become really just like unmanageable. Limited time progression track doesn't always actively improve a game but it does always increase that game's revenue, so throw yep. it in the box. By now, even the concept of a fun, well-made game is starting to look like a horrifically augmented shadow of its former self. Imagine what a well-made game would look like if you tried to shoehorn in all of the techniques in this box. And unfortunately, eventually... I know what it's like. I played it last year. It was called Diablo Immortal. You won't need to imagine. We're seeing it more and more. Later that same year, one of my yeah. favorite games comes out. Assassin's Creed Black Flag, a fantastic pirate game. There's just one problem. Unless you own both a PlayStation and an Xbox and are willing to buy two copies of the game, you can never experience the full game. Black Flag featured console-exclusive levels, which not only fueled the petty console wars, oh, but also God. highlighted the fact that marketing executives were now powerful enough to tell games developers exactly what their players deserved, or more importantly, what their non-players don't deserve. This is not player-focused design at all. And while I completely understand the power of console exclusives, when I walked into a game shop and picked up two copies of Black Flag and realized, no matter what I choose, there is a mission I won't get to play because I don't have the right console, that didn't leave a good taste in my mouth. So no, it sucks. Uh, it, it absolutely sucks. Like, my opinion has always been that console exclusive games are trash. There is no benefit for the user that some game is console exclusive on PlayStation. There will never be a situation where this game only being available on PlayStation makes it better for the people playing it. While Dota may have started the Battle Pass idea, it was almost perfected four years later in 2017 by Fortnite Season 2, which replaced the Season Shop with a Battle Pass system. Played Fortnite four years never spent a single cent and then later in november of 2017 we witness a bit of gaming history and it fills us all with a sense of pride and accomplishment star wars battlefront 2 was an people fucking went ape shit about this oh my god this was bad amazing game which released back in 2005 not to be confused with star wars battlefront 2 which was a mediocre game which released in 2017 it was a full price game and yet also had a loot box system in it along with premium currency system this yep. led to a reddit user complaining yep. that even though they'd bought the 80 dollars it takes 40 hours to unlock a hero uh, that's what this says um Apparently, this uh, after reading this post, a developer at uh, on the Overwatch team uh, got a promotion after they gave their new idea for the new game, uh, Overwatch Two. They said only forty hours. You're just giving it Deluxe away for free at that point. The game, they still couldn't play as Darth Vader from day one. Unlocking yeah. Darth Vader means buying his hero crate, which costs 60,000 in-game credits, or you can spend real money. Now, you can earn an average of 250 credits per 10-minute match at the time, so you'd have to grind for roughly 40 hours of constant gameplay, longer than the average completion time of most video games, to unlock a single rare character Jesus. or you could pay crystals in the premium and the thing is like for example if you had to spend that much time just to unlock the character i wouldn't really give a fuck about that the problem is that you can just spend money to bypass it if you couldn't bypass it it'd be fine i wouldn't care shop and spend those on hero crates and just hope. EA responded to this Reddit complaint saying the reason crates were so expensive or take so long to mm -hmm. unlock is to give a sense of pride and accomplishment to players who did manage to unlock them. This becomes the most down of pride. Oh wow, I spent a hundred dollars. I have Darth Vader. I'm a winner. Holy fuck, man. Yeah, this has a negative uh, 667,000 uh, up dudes. Th that's a lot of down dudes.
pride and accomplishment to players who did manage to unlock them. This becomes the most downvoted comment in Reddit history. So, locking premium parts of your full-priced game behind either hours of grind or spending even more money to unlock the cool stuff before other people who bought the same game as you. Now, it's important to understand that games having things locked within them is not necessarily bad design. One of my favourite games of all time is SSX Tricky, the snowboarding game. And as you play through that, you unlock new characters. New yeah, it's totally fine that it takes a really long time to unlock certain characters. The problem isn't that it takes a long time to unlock other characters. The problem is that you can spend money to bypass the time. New boards and new tracks. Progression within a game and rewarding that progression with new mechanics, new characters and new areas is not bad. The problem was progression wasn't the only way to unlock this. You could simply pay yeah, more exactly. money to get it immediately. There it is. And because it was a competitive game, people who paid the extra money were at an advantage over those who did exactly. not. Exactly. This is a video about how newer games feel wrong. And it feels wrong to buy the same game as someone else and to know that they will have an advantage over you if they pay more. Throw the I totally fucking agree with that. I, I, I think that's probably one of the best ways to say it too. Like, why do you want to play a game that's a competitive game that you're set up to lose in? It's it, it just sucks, man. Like, that's why I think a lot of people stop doing like WoW PvP also, because like you don't have all the best gear. Why do you want to go in there? I'll be right back. I went to a grocery store a day before a show and a guy there he was looking at me weird, and he walked by me like three times, just like, okay. You know, it's gonna be like a thing. And so he comes up to me, he's like, bro, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, I do YouTube. He's like, that's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, I thought I knew you. A fan, there's a viewer. And he's like, I watched a video of you about Elden Ring. I'm like, is that right? He says, yeah, you were watching somebody else's video, and they didn't like Elden Ring, and you were saying they were stupid. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. That was me. And he's like, and they were stupid. I'm like, I know, right? I'm like, did you play Elden Ring? He's like, yeah, it was great. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what that guy was talking about. That guy was a fucking idiot. And he's like, yeah, can I get a picture with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's like, uh, you know, he's look so, I see him looking over at like, it's like middle-aged man with like a, you know, everything, you know, like prim and proper. I'm like, that's your manager? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm not on break. It's like, ah, oh, it's fine. And I'm like, just get out of line of sight of the manager. We'll just go stand over here. He won't be able to see you. And uh, he's like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's fine. And I did it. Actually worked. Straight up fucking worked. LOS the manager. <laughs> Took a picture with the dude. Drove home. Did the stream. That in the box of abusive monetization. Why not? It's going to work. Yeah. And then five years later, Diablo Immortal happened. Oh, good. Now, I already covered Diablo Immortal pretty extensively in the video, The Diabolically Immoral Diablo Immortal, and mm -hmm. its follow up about the legendary crests, because it took basically every idea from the big box of abusive monetization and sprinkled them liberally over. It's kind of like imagine thinking of like there's a list of every immoral and predatory practice for a video game to have. And Diablo Immortal used that list like a checklist. And they got a 100, too. For a somewhat Diablo-looking game, including multiple premium currencies, a deliberately mm -hmm. similar in-game item which functions slightly differently to a paid version of the same thing, and multiple battle passes all called different things. But don't worry, because everyone assured me that Diablo Immortal was a mobile game, and thus would not be representative of the actual next Diablo game, which would be Diablo 4. Everyone told me Diablo 4 would be a full game by itself, with no cash shop, mm -hmm. with gameplay first, and none of the strategies from the big box of badness. I don't think anybody said that Diablo 4 wasn't going to have anything like that. I just think it's not going to be pay to win. And for everything that I've read so far, it's not pay to win except for being able to spend money on the head start, which I think is undoubtedly pay to win. So of course the, the are... sad thing about that though is like I'll, I'll give them credit. Like if I was a game developer, I would also allow people to pay money to play the game early because it staggers out the amount of people and the amount of stress on your servers. It's kind of like a soft release to see how your servers are gonna be able to do. And also you make more money with it. So it's like a win-win situation. It's like a, like it's, it's logistically a good idea and it's financially a good idea. Like Lost Ark did that. I feel like most games are gonna do this just because it, it works.
are various digital versions of the game, the more expensive ones, giving you an accelerated battle pass bonus, allowing mm -hmm. you to progress quicker, and there is a cosmetic cash shop using its own proprietary currency. And if yes. you're thinking Diablo doesn't need all these extra bells and whistles to be a good Diablo game, you are correct. <laughs> these have not True. been added because they make the game better. They've been added because they make the game money. And then Dark Tide yes. released, which is... Uh, I think that's actually a really, really simple way of putting it. I'm, I'm going to rip the game better. They've been whoa, whoa. You are correct. These have not been added because they make the game better. They've been added because they make the game money. And then Dark... That's exactly right. It's, it's to make money, not make the game better. And that's what I think the real problem with this is. It's that it's all about just making more and more money... And there is no thought, no concern, no value placed on the consumer experience. Tide released, which is a full price game with an abusively priced cash shop. Or you can Ooh. grind for hours and hours Ooh. and hours and hours and Ooh. hours to get some of the cheap things yes. in that shop. And now That's hit. the thing is like I have people, they're like, man, I'm the same item level as you in Lost Ark. Oh, you're a whale. No, you're not. You're a loser. It's like. Well, I only play 17 hours a day on 15 alts. It's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm an idiot then, huh? Is that right? So why have games become like this? Simple, because games are businesses. Games have been yeah. businesses since arcades, since consoles allowed you to buy the game and have it in your own home. They have always wanted to make money. But up until now, the best way to make the most amount of money was to make the best game you possibly could because people would buy it, and that was it. The transaction was finished. It was fair. The best way to make money on modern games is to make the best framework as a holder for these strategies. And companies have experimented with various methods to increase income over the years, from gacha loot boxes to pre-orders, console exclusives to mm -hmm. battle passes, energy systems to just straight up selling power and instead of and this is only so far keep this in mind there will be a new idea you know what i should do i should try to come up with the next predatory idea in video gaming like what's the next step yeah i should really try to think like what is the next thing that we should do like get a patent on it sell the patent to activision for you know like 70 million dollars and then develop my own game with the same system in game designers, they hired psychologists to build habits, to reinforce addictive behaviors, to design gameplay loops mm -hmm. which encourage spending. The problem was these techniques were never about the player having fun. They were about the user being monetized. And when a marketing executive pictures like the you playing a there. game, you aren't pictured smiling and laughing with friends. You're pictured opening your wallet and reaching for your credit card. Because you're, pi you're not pictured. You aren't pictured. A number is pictured. That's their goal. And eventually, the Pandora's box of abusive monetization strategies was so full of proven, effective techniques that making a game is often no longer about the game, at least not for the people in charge of the money. The game I think that battle passes at this point are always going to be three tier. You're going to have the battle pass, the, 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 uh, the, the poor people's battle pass, where like you work for 40 hours and you get... Um, like uh, seven uh, like uh, bronze bars or something like that. And uh, then if you go and you uh, you buy like the normal uh, the normal premium battle pass, you get all of the cool pay to win stuff like you know like a thousand bronze bars or you know a thousand gold bars for just playing for 30 minutes. And uh, then if you buy the the empowered ultimate wizard uh, battle champion warlord, chieftain of gaming uh battle pass which is more money then you get the cool cosmetics game is now simply a life support system for as many of these systems as you can yeah. design into it the game is a host and the parasite of monetization has begun to take over yeah. and the unfortunate reality is this it's like the guy at the beginning of men in black works even with a breakout incredible success like elden ring which won game of the year and sold over 18 million like copies game. as of this video at 60 dollars a sale that's over a billion dollars in sales worldwide still not as much as an anime waifu in genshin impact as hard as they try as hard as they work not as much as a waifu in genshin impact holy fuck isn't that sad that is still slightly shy of how much money Genshin Impact made this year. Ah, it is there still it is. shy of how much money FIFA Ultimate Team has made every year for the last four years.
The reality yep. is when companies look at that pie chart of game development time and how they divide developer time or invested money, that big box of abusive monetization strategies, that Pandora's box of terribleness is so effective, they would be hurting their own profit to not put at least some of the techniques in. The older designers yep. simply didn't have the knowledge of this box. And even if they did, they didn't have the technology to act on it at the time. Yeah, and I also, that's a very good point. If Nintendo could have done this in 1995 with the Super Nintendo, they would have. It's just that they couldn't do it then, that's all. Modern design often puts the player into an awkward position where the game has spent more no, time it's getting focusing bigger. on the manipulative, abusive systems than it has on just being the best game it could be. So what is the exact choice which makes games feel wrong? Is it MapleStory's fault for adding Gachapon? Is it Oblivion's fault for the horse armor? Is it Do No, it's the player's fault for buying them. That's whose fault it is, because they could have put all of this stuff in the game and people wouldn't have played it, and then the game would have died, you would have never seen another game like that. So ultimately, it's the player's fault. Ultimate's fault for the battle pass, FIFA's fault for the success of Ultimate Team. Is it Farmville's fault for mastering the addiction cycle? Or is it EA's fault for locking away Darth Vader? Unfortunately, it's kind of all of them. It's just the reality of games design today. You cannot close the lid on- Well, I also think that to an extent, there is a certain level of personal accountability. There are people behind these purchases. People choose to spend this money in this way. And those people enable these practices and prevent us from having more games like Elden Ring. Pandora's box. Designers can't unknow the effectiveness of these techniques. And every game made for the rest of time has to either use them or actively choose to avoid them. So the exact choice that makes a game go from being the best it can possibly be to anti-player or anti-consumer is when a designer or a marketing executive stops thinking about how they can make the best game they're capable of and starts throwing some sly glances toward the box in the corner. And when I don't even think that it's the game designers. I think the people that are making these games, like I, I really, I'm not even kidding. I think that the people who are making a game like Diablo Immortal or Diablo 4 or Overwatch 2, I think these guys really try to make a good game. They do. But whenever you're given, um, let, let's see, uh, a pile of shit, some candles that don't work, and a, uh, a Roman candle, it's pretty hard to make a good tasting cake. That's the truth. So it's, it's not even really their fault. It's just how things go. And they say, hey, this technique may not fit our game perfectly, but it's proven That's to make a, a lot of money. Do you oh. think we could put it in our game? That is the moment. Any specific game goes downhill from what it could be from a player's perspective. And the worst yeah. part is that big evil box and all its dark design knowledge is constantly being added to. And when you play a new game and spot the cash shop and the battle pass and the premium currency and the awkward pack size and the loot boxes and the exclusive levels, and when you just feel sad that the game yeah. didn't have to do that, that's when you know that the pie chart of design of this game had at least a small slice dedicated to that stupid box. A small slice focused on making the game a little bit anti-player in the name of a lot of profit. And this is another really important thing whenever we talk about like uh, games like, for example, Vampire Survivors or Elden Ring. It's one of the reasons why I do try to elevate those games and talk about how positive they are and play them more on stream. And a game like Valheim, we're going to play Valheim again pretty soon here. Like, you know, you, you want to you wanna give credibility to that. Because the truth is that regardless of whether Genshin Impact made a bunch of money or not, or whether MapleStory made a bunch of money or not, Elden Ring is going to forever be known as a great game. Dark Souls 1 will be forever known as a great game. And Super Mario World will be forever known as a great game. These other games will never be remembered as that. I understand a lot of people might not care about that, but it's a good thing that at least some people out there do. But personally, I also know it can be very cathartic to be angry at a thing instead of a concept. So let's yeah. all just collectively agree 
It's to Bobby's blame fault. the stupid horse. Yeah, Cheers for there watching. it is. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube who keep the channel alive. You can support from only one pound a month. Check the description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and our Discord. And as always, have a great day. Well, 2022. I'm not going to watch this one right now, but uh, I, I definitely fucking agree with pretty much everything Josh said in this I video. Love like, I, I, I love these videos. This video was so good. Please, guys, make sure to give it a like. Subscribe to Josh Drive Hayes. He's fucking great. He's been on All Craft before. Big friend of the stream. We love Josh. I am very glad to see more people talking about this. And also, it's a game like Dark and Darker is another example. It's a good game. It doesn't have any of this bullshit in it. It's just a good game, and that's it. I'm not the kind of person to not play a game if it has microtransactions and bad stuff in it, if I think it's good content. But I am somebody to give, like, I, I don't view that, I, I view it as a negative.